Last week, we had Jean Homerghausen to preach for us. Jean is a seminary student at Columbia Seminary and also doing a, a, an internship during this fall on, on faith and arts. And we're working alongside one another as Jean does that. She, she preached on imagination and challenged us to think about how imagination makes our faith even more alive to take a look at that. One of the things she challenged us to do was to take a look at scripture using Lectio Divina, which means divine reading. And it's a three or four part reading of scripture. And when I went to prepare for the sermon this week, I thought I'm gonna try this um, initial reading of scripture by Lectio Divina, as Jean had um, suggested. So in this style of reading, you are invited to read the text and just sit with it for a moment. See what rises out for you there, what words stand out. Don't judge them, they are the words that stand out to you. Then you read it again, and you sit with it. Underline or highlight what's standing out to you, a string of words, a word, an image. It makes you think of something. Write that down. You sit with it again. Any repeated images, words, thoughts, anything else that rises up from you that, that had not risen up before, is there a word that the Lord is saying to you, for you, something that strikes you as unusual. We don't tend to have a scripture and keep coming back at it, but that is the nature of the Lectio Divina, is to read it and sit with it, ingest it, let it pour over you. Let it bring whatever it brings without judgment. So I did that with, especially with this um, Matthew text. I did it as well with the Thessalonians, but that Matthew text will kind of call me crazy. But what kept coming to my mind as I read the last statement of this gospel lesson was the 1972 song by Don McLean, American Pie. Bye, bye, Miss American Pie. I'm just getting it in like that earworm, so you can start to think about that. But particularly the line, the day the music died. That's what came to my mind. The song American Pie became something of a lament for a generation of young adults um, between the loss of the utopian dreams of the 1950s and the darker decades of the 60s. And in the 70s, Don McLean, who, who lived formative in his teen years during that time, wrote down these words to describe his own reaction to the time. He remained cryptic about the meaning of American Pie for years. It just was what it was. And then finally, it led people to, to sort of uh, speculate some hidden messages about it. But when uh, McLean finally spoke about this, this song, he said that it was about the 1959 tragic deaths of rising star Buddy Holly and a, a couple of musician friends who were in a plane crash with him. McLean said that at that point for him, everything stopped, the world changed. For him, it marked the death of innocence. And so he wrote this song to talk about a place, an event that threw him into another place, which didn't have any room for preparing, but all of a sudden he was from one place to another without preparation. McLean's complex way of talking about this event in time, and it went on to be an over 600 word ballad, and it resonated with many who found themselves in a place of lament, in a place of uncertainty. There's a dramatic shift that is happening in our gospel 
passage this morning that places Jesus in a final week of his life. The gospel readings over the past weeks, as I said before, have been the string of challenges from the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus, basically all the temple leaders who were looking for any way to challenge and discredit Jesus. The way that Matthew tells it is that the temple leaders approach Jesus while he is teaching in the temple, something he was allowed to do as a rabbi, and he's surrounded by crowds of people who long to hear what he's saying and and teaching. And it would be a strategic move for these leaders of the temple to find some way to embarrass or discredit Jesus in front of his followers. So that's what they're trying to do. It was question after question after question as we're reading in Matthew. And this will be the final time of those challenges. And it ends with a defining shift. And after that, no one dared ask Jesus any more questions. End of questions. The day the questions died. You might say that that last statement of Jesus answered it all, but that's not necessarily the case. Scholars say that Jesus posed more of a riddle than a question when he talks about whose Lord was David's, who was David's Lord. It was sort of a riddle. That last statement of Jesus proved to some that they were dealing with a mystery far beyond their imagining And to others, these tactics of silencing and getting rid of Jesus were going to have to be re-strategized. They were going to have to go back and think about this again. They all backed up, and they backed away, and they put space between it all, at least for a time. In fact, as I kept reading in the lectionary during this week, all the passages seem to have some sort of defining shift or break or space in them. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, and he's still remembering this painful time that he spent in Philippi, this poor treatment of the church there um, upon himself and his fellow evangelists. And then he's comparing that with this tender welcome and this tender treatment that he has in Thessalonia. This time, Paul says, is going to be different. Our relationship, Paul says to them, is going to be different. And perhaps it's because the people in Thessalonica are just nicer people. Perhaps they're just easier to get along with. Or perhaps it is because that Paul from Philippi to Thessalonica had a break, had a time to think about it, had a time between ministries, because Paul sort of indicates that he had something of a light bulb moment, a reorienting about his experience in one place as he goes to another, wondering what is his ministry about anyway. His ministry challenged in one place, welcomed in the other. And Paul understood, again, that his ministry was to carry the good news of God, not his own. So that wherever he found himself, whether in contrary community of Philippi or in the convivial community of Thessalonica, God is the one who defines his presence and work. Paul understood that better from that break in time. So what is rising up for me in these scriptures is this time that marks a dramatic shift between events and provides an in-between place and space 
that plays perhaps subtly in the scripture text, but which I believe define an important shift in the work of the people of God. Church leaders and theologians are talking a lot about all of this to these days, writing a lot about it, and they're calling it liminal space, liminal time. Shifts in the way things have been to the way that things must be. They are especially interested in addressing this in the very uncomfortable place that we find ourselves in the world today in this pandemic time, now more than eight months in. We're in this great pause between how the world was and now how it must be. This great pause where we need to consider how life will be going forward. There's more that we know now, but a vaccine is not yet ready. Our masks and our distancing are still the best way to keep a virus at bay from one another. Life and death have continued, but our grieving and our celebrations have been put on hold, even stunted. Yes, this is liminal time. Grieving for what is behind us, lamenting our losses. Unsure of what's ahead of us, we find ourselves in this place. Father Richard Rohr defines liminal as betwixt and between. My father and his wife used to have a celebration between Christmas and New Year's to get their neighbors together, and he called it the Twixt and Tween party because Christmas is so busy and, and gathering elsewhere on New Year's so busy, but in the Twixt and Tween, they saw one another differently. Betwixt and between, having left one room or one stage of life, but not yet entered into the next. We usually enter liminal space when our former way has been challenged or changed. Perhaps we lose a job or a loved one during an illness, at the birth of a child, at a major relocation. Father Rohr says liminal time is graced time, but often it does not feel graced in any way. In such a space, we are not certain or in control. Does any of that feel familiar to you? Father Rohr goes on. He said, it's no surprise that we generally avoid liminal space. Much of the work of authentic spirituality and human development is to get people into liminal space and keep them there long enough that they can learn something essential and new. Many spiritual giants like St. Francis, Julian of Norwich, Dorothy Day, Mohandas Gandhi, they tried to live their entire lives in permanent liminality on the edge or periphery of the dominant culture. This in-between place is free of illusions and false payoffs. It invites us to discover and live from border perspectives and with much deeper seeing. Another one who is writing a lot about liminal space is Susan Beaumont. She's one of the leading voices on church dynamics these days. And she says that, in fact, God's people have gone through periods of liminality since the beginning of time. I don't think it makes it easier for us knowing that, she says, but I think that it should make us more hopeful. Every one of the great biblical stories that we delight in is a story of liminality. Every one of our biblical heroes is a story of someone transformed, 
who goes from an old identity to a new identity. We see this in the figure of Moses. We see this in Job and Jonah. We see this in Abraham and Sarah. We see this on Holy Saturday with Jesus in the tomb. Everyone is drawn out of, I was this kind of person in this settled place, and then that identity undid itself, and God took me to a new identity. Beaumont says that the simplest way to describe liminality is to say that it's a threshold moment. Liminality is that in-between space where, the, where you are neither here nor there, and it's a very rich time organizationally and institutionally for an organization to rediscover a lot about itself and to become creative. In our Park Lake Church chat this, this week, we talked a lot about this time of liminality, this time of being betwixt and between, a threshold moment. What does that mean for you personally? What does that mean for us as a church of Christ? Paul describes that liminal space as a time of testing for him. In fact, he says God tested him in this liminal time. It's certainly true that liminal space is a place where we are tested to think about those things that we were certain about and to enter into the unknown untried places, unwelcome places in some instances. Liminal time and space ask us to allow room for something genuinely new to happen. It asks us to be vulnerable and open, empty and receptive, humble and teachable. It's a wonder that people choose to do this but in liminal time, there's growth. So, liminal means threshold, doorway. The transition from one room, one space or place to another. And while I was preparing the sermon this week, I did a little spiritual practice of pausing in doorways. It sounds rather silly as I think about it, but it is hard to stand in a doorway. A doorway is something that is meant to separate places, meant to be passed through quickly, and I am one who likes to keep moving forward. I will go out of my way traveling if I am stopped, even though Dan would say, it's 50 miles further this way, and I would say, yes, but I can keep moving. <laughs> it's important for me. But in this space, I would stop and stand in the doorway, and I felt this uncomfortable strain in my body as I leaned forward to the next step, but was committed to stand in that place of transition. And that's the thing about our liminal times. They aren't always the same length of time. Sometimes they are just a quick step from one to the other. Other times we can't see the way forward and we're stuck in waiting mode in that threshold. Liminal time is always a time of pausing and should always be a time of listening and anticipating. Another liminal scripture that came to my mind in the church chat was when we, I thought about the prophet Jeremiah who spoke to the exiles who were in Babylon and those exiles were just longing to come home, crying to come home praying to God, just take us back to the temple, to Israel. And the word of the Lord comes to these people and says, you who are in exile, build homes in Babylon. Plant gardens, have family, do these things that take time. 
Pray for Babylon, because if it goes well for Babylon, for your liminal space, it goes well for you. Our first grandchild is to be born in just a couple of weeks. And of course, we're excited about this new step of parenting for our daughter and son-in-law and grandparenting for us. And we can't wait to get our arms around that child. Many of you have already told me how extraordinary grandparenting is, just the best gift that you can imagine. But it's not time. And in these last crucial weeks, her bones are hardening, her lungs are developing, fat is being added all over her body to protect her and to keep her warm. And every day she gets to continue that process that makes her birth and the beginning of her life outside of the womb all the more successful. And so we wait because she's not ready for us. Because this liminal time in her life and in ours is important to the next step. I was telling one of my spiritual directors about pausing in door frames this week and about the birth of, or the coming birth of our granddaughter. And she said to me, you know, Saint Anne mother of Mary, grandmother of Jesus, is the patron saint of doorways. I don't know anything about saints, but I love the image that there is a patron saint of doorways and that she's a grandmother and that she understands the need and the value of liminal time and space. For us believers, for followers of Christ, for children of God, it is very important as we consider these liminal spaces that we find ourselves in, that this liminal space is also a space of God's time, of kairos, of God's movement. So we hold in tension these funky places that we find ourselves that we did not invite ourselves to be in. Hand in hand with God's kairos, God's timing. And it is in that time and when we ask God to prepare us for the next steps that we find the hope and the patience to be where we are. Not alone, not without learning or openness, but in God's time, in God's company, knowing that whatever God is doing in us, through us, in this liminal time, it is not wasted time. It might be time that we struggle with, but it is not wasted. That's that's how we, as Christians, as followers of Christ, welcome this time. It is not time yet, whatever that is that you're waiting for. It may be when you step across that door and leave that that is time. Or it may be that you need to linger a while, inviting the presence of God to be more real for you in that time. Think of all those thresholds that you stand in. I want to invite you to practice with me pausing in a threshold or two this week, saying a prayer of lament, or or you might be grateful for a time to slow down, praying that God join you there, prepare you for what is next, Hold the hands of others who wait in that liminal space. 
This is gift and promise that I found in scripture this week. I pray that it is gift and promise for you as well. Amen.